Tonight's two final round teams have already progressed through two prior rounds. We have arguing for the petitioners the Charles Sumner team, which we have Frederick Bellamy, who was one of the oralists, Bennett Cooper, another of the oralists, Benjamin Gibson, Mark Mathy, Gail Robinson, and Richard Shearer. On the, for the respondents, we have the Mira Bradwell team, and we have Ralph Berman, oralist, Rick Chesson, Roberta Harding, Stephen Kennedy, Lauren Reisner, another of the oralists, and Chip Yergaitis. Um, we would like to just first say that pictures will be allowed before the arguments actually begin. We ask you not to take pictures during the arguments, since this could be very distracting to both the participants and the judges. And we also would like to invite you all, after the argument, to join us for a reception in the John Chipman Gray Room in Pound Hall. We wish the participants luck, and we hope that you enjoy the argument. Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. We'll hear argument now in cause number 85204, In Re Triff Products Liability Litigation. Uh, counsel for petitioners ready? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Chief Justice, Your Honor, may it please the court. My name is Frederick Douglas Bellamy, and I, along with my co-counsel, represent Deuteronomy Chemical, the United Motors Corporation, and Klein Marsden Motors in these proceedings. This case is before the court from the United States Court of Appeals to the Ames Circuit on a writ of certiorari over two issues. First, I shall argue that federal common law does not govern petitioner's liability for compensatory and punitive damages in this litigation. Second, my co-counsel, Bennett Evan Cooper, will argue that the district court certification under federal rule of civil procedure 23B1B for trial of punitive damages claims in a mandatory class action represents an abuse of the trial court's discretion that is both statutorily and constitutionally defective. Over 3,000 suits have been filed in federal and state courts involving alleged injuries due to exposure to trioxalate formaldehyde or TRIF, a fire retardant manufactured by Deuteronomy Chemical. All federal cases have been transferred for either coordination or consolidation to the District of Ames. And Yardley versus Deuteronomy has been designated as a lead action for pretrial purposes. Pursuant to regulations of the Federal Consumer Product Safety Commission, United Motors treated the interiors of its cars with trips supplied by Deuteronomy Chemical. Respondent Glennis Yardley alleges that she has been injured by TRIF in a UMC car which she purchased from Klein Mars and Motors. In her complaint, respondent asked for compensatory and punitive damages for three counts asserted against petitioners negligence, strict liability, and breach of implied warranties. On respondents' motions, the district court certified two nationwide class actions. One, a class certified under Federal Rule 23B3 for trial of liability for compensatory damages, and two, 
a, cl a mandatory class action certified under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23B1B for trial of liability for punitive damages. The trial court also denied petitioner's motions under Rule 12B6 for partial dismissal for failure to state any federal claims in which relief could be granted. On appeal by petitioners, the Court of Appeals affirmed the trial court certification of the 23B1B mandatory class for trial of punitive damage claims, and it held that petitioner's liability in this case should be governed by federal common law. I shall argue three key points. First, because Congress has declared that petitioner's liability for the claims alleged by respondent shall be governed by state law, the federal courts may not create federal common law to supplant those state laws. Second, even if Congress had not declared that state law shall govern petitioner's liability in this case, no federal interest exists that is substantial enough to justify the, su the supplanting of state laws in this case. Third, because respondent has not pleaded any claims arising under federal law, the district court's dismissal of petitioner's motion for partial dismissal for failure to state any federal claims in which relief can be granted is erroneous and should be reversed. The Court of Appeals below pointed to many policy reasons why it believed that the state laws that created respondents' claims should be homogenized in this case into one set of uniform federally created rules. Whether that is good policy, however, is not the question before the court. The threshold question is whether the federal courts are authorized to make that policy judgment. Our first point is that because it is Congress that ultimately controls federal common law, Congress's decision to preserve state products liability laws bars application of federal common law in this case. In Northwest Airlines versus the Transport Workers Union, this court stated that federal common law is subject to the paramount authority of Congress. The Court of Appeals below held that states have no substantial interest in governing the liability of petitioners in this case. Congress, however, has explicitly recognized the importance of allowing states to govern what products liability. What language in the statute do you rely on for the statement that Congress has expressly provided that state law should govern? In Title 15, Sections 2072 of the, and 2074 of the United States Code, the Congress stated in 2072 that any federal claims arising from violation of any federal consumer product safety rules would be in addition to, but not in lieu of, any state claims. Furthermore, in Section 2074, the Congress declared that compliance with any federal consumer product safety rules could not relieve any liability under state statutory or common law in, in, in products liability cases. But isn't that a far cry from saying, from, from saying that although this cannot be a defense, uh, nonetheless state law rather than a uniform federal law should apply? Well, we believe, Your Honor, that Congress has manifested its intent fairly clearly in this case. But is it explicit, as you just said, or is it implied? In a manner of speaking, it is implied. However, we do note that Congress also in the legislative history manifested an intent to have state substantive rules of decision govern even the federal actions that arise under the Consumer Product Safety Act from implied rights of actions under Section 2072. Therefore, we do not feel that Congress could have made itself any more explicit because Congress didn't, just didn't incorporate state liability rules into federal actions. It decided to leave state laws to govern in and of themselves under their own power. Well, the Court of Appeals, I guess, took the position that the federal courts were just gonna, not going to be able to exercise their diversity jurisdiction in these cases if the rule that they uh, opted for wasn't followed. And I suppose you could say that Congress didn't have that, be, that situation before it at any rate. Well, Your Honor, first of all, we note that respondents' right to have her case heard in a federal forum is not really in danger at this point, Your Honor. It is sheer speculation to suggest that this judicial gridlock that respondent has spoken of will deny the respondent's right to have her claims heard in a federal court. And furthermore, 
Congress itself has the power to formulate rules to deal with any problems that may arise on a national level, and the states themselves could alter those product liability laws that created respondents' claims in light of any national repercussions should the need arise. It, that is, if we don't have federal common law applying this case. If there were factual findings that the time and effort to apply the varying state laws to mass tort claims generally would seriously hamper the operations of federal courts. Could Congress enact a statute that said that federal common law should govern this type of case? Well, although in Erie Railroad Company versus Tompkins, Justice Brandeis suggested that perhaps the field of torts was simply beyond Congress's powers, um, the, the petitioners in this case are not questioning Congress's power to, deal, to do so. We are simply stating that given that Congress has decided to allow state products liability laws to govern state products liability cases, and given that Congress also itself has declined to create any federal products liability laws uh, in general, um, that Congress has, ex has virtually explicitly stated that <laughs> Uh, state laws must continue to govern in this case. The, the problem with your argument may be that you're focusing on uh, the tort law generally and the product liability laws generally. And, and uh, the, the uh, respondent's brief points out that they are tracking the Kansas v. Colorado kind of case, the the kind of case where from the peculiar facts of that particular case or in this case this, the, 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 the mass of litigation which is pending uh, simply makes it impossible for state law to handle it. Just as in uh, uh, Kansas v. Colorado, state law could not handle the water problem and in the other cases state law simply in that line of authority, state law could not handle the divergent uh, state tax laws. And plaintiffs claim that this case is like that, and you don't really respond to that in your brief. Well, Your Honor, Respondents Learned Counsel have indeed suggested that the interstate nature of this litigation requires the application of federal common law for two reasons. First, to ensure uniform treatment of plaintiffs in this case, and second, because of this second more Article III interstate rivalry type of thing that the state, by having state laws govern, they state that the state laws will sort of burn themselves up and there won't be anything left. Um, going to their latter point first, it is true that federal common law applies to cases involving interstate rivalry. Respondents suggest that the underlying rationale of such application is the protection of individual interests. That, however, is not true. The court has held in the Kansas v. Colorado line of cases that the application of federal common law is necessary when the rights of states as corporate entities are implicated or when states themselves are asserting their interests against other states. The, the well, the, 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 there are some other cases like the Hendelider case that uh, applies that reasoning to in, when private parties are the litigants. In the Hindelider case, the fact that the private parties has to do more or less with a, a glitch in the case. To a, the Colorado State Engineer was being sued by the Hinderleiter company because under the terms of an interstate compact, he had diverted water over to New Mexico. The plaintiff in that case was suing the state engineer, claiming that his right to property was being violated by the state engineer's actions. But the Supreme Court held that because the case necessarily involved adjudication of New Mexico's rights as a corporate entity because New Mexico had negotiated the interstate compact with Colorado that federal common law was the only law that could apply because in the Article 3 sense historically when states as corporate entities are asserting their interests against other states they could either resort to war or force. M Mr. Or, Bellamy, yes. isn't, aren't, isn't that line of cases really dependent upon a finding of necessity? Now, if Congress failed to act in the face of a clear judicial emergency in the federal judiciary, is the federal judiciary powerless to protect itself as an independent branch? 
No, Your Honor. In fact, um, the court held in Louisiana Power and Light Company versus Thubador City that the duty of diversity jurisdiction is not absolute. And the court noted that the abstention doctrine is, is a narrow exception to the duty to diversity jurisdiction that may be used to avoid the, quote, hazard of unsettling some delicate Which balance. abstention, which of the traditional abstention doctrines would apply here? The abstention doctrine, the very narrow one involving avoidance of needless friction with state policies. However, mm -hmm. we're not stating that such a doctrine would apply in this case. We're simply suggesting that if the speculative and remote problems that the respondent and the Court of Appeals are worried about do arise, and this judicial gridlock problem does get out of hand, and the court has employed all of the tools it is clearly authorized to use, such as, pre as coordinated discovery, et cetera, and we are still faced with a national problem and Congress doesn't act, then perhaps the trial court should consider in its discretion whether that abstention doctrine should apply. However, the case is extraordinary here, and there simply isn't any precedent for such a use based on destruction of the federal judiciary. What about, uh, aside from uh, destruction of the judiciary, what about the limited fund problem? Didn't that uh, assume arguendo there were, uh, was an evidentiary hearing, and okay. it was established that there is a limited fund? In How would you, uh, would yeah. that create the necessity to justify uh, the federal common law? Well, Your Honor, the applying federal common law would not solve the problem of a limited fund in general. If one is speaking about the, oh, absolute, in this case. the absolute physical limits of the petitioners in this case, instead of any due process limits on the punitive damages, because there will still be over 1,600 suits in state courts and probably more developing and there would still be the possibility of a race of judgment that would exhaust petitioner's actual physical limits, uh, the, the physical limits of his assets. The only thing gained by applying federal common law here is the elimination of the choice of law problems that arise from the district court's attempt to circumvent their gridlock worry with trial of all the federal cases in one fell swoop. Because the 23B3 class is not a mandatory class, there's, there, is no poss there is no injunction, and the respondent has not suggested that there should be one for compensatory damages. And therefore, should there be this race to judgment problem, then uh, the federal common law will not solve that. Furthermore, a respondent has also suggested that federal common law should be applied in order to ensure uniform treatment of the plaintiffs in this case. There is no legitimate interest in achieving uniform treatment among plaintiffs in different states here, however, because we're dealing with state-created rights, not federally created rights. The differences between various state policies represent individual communities' tailoring of the basic tort schemes to their fundamental values. The basic laws are largely similar. For example, all 50 states have adopted the restatement of torts, second, 402A, approach to strict liability, and yet there is this large raging controversy over whether punitive damages are consistent with that legal theory. Counsel, you're now using your rebuttal time. Excuse me, Your Honor, I believe I have uh, uh, five minutes left. Oh, is that correct? I thought it wasn't with all the lights on. That oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper, you may proceed. Chief Justice, Your Honors, may it please the court. My name is Bennett Evan Cooper, and I am co-counsel for the petitioners in this case. I'd like to turn the court's attention to the second question before it, whether the certification of a mandatory class for punitive damages under Federal Rule 23B1B constitutes an abuse of the district court's discretion, violates the Anti-Injunction Act, and abridges the constitutional rights of litigants in this case. I wish to make three principal points tonight. First, plaintiff class asserts only a specious interest in an illusory 
limited fund of punitive damages. Second, the certification of a mandatory class action violate, by enjoining state court actions, pending actions, violates the Anti-Injunction Act and thereby upsets the delicate balance struck by Congress between the states and the federal government and between the courts and Congress itself. Third, and equally important, the certification of a mandatory class in this case violates the constitutional rights of litigants by forcing plaintiffs who wish to opt out to litigate their punitive damage claims in an Ames forum. It violates their rights to due process under this court's decision in Schutz, in the Phillips Petroleum Company versus Schutz. Mr. Cooper, why are you arguing against a mandatory class? Wouldn't it be, the, to, be to the benefit of your clients to have one trial and an opportunity to win on liability and be out from under the specter of multiple punitive damage claims? No, Your Honor, because the problem of, mutual, of uh, repetitive punitive damage claims can be taken care of through a number of other uh, sorts of techniques that the lower court has suggested. Uh, but, but why isn't this just as useful and just as efficient a technique for your clients? We feel that um, it would be better to deal with all the claims um, relating to class, subclasses of plaintiffs in one forum. That is, have the juries that are trying the uh, liability claims also try the punitive damage claims. Um, as in, that, in that, that will happen uh, except for those uh, parties who opt out of the uh, li compensatory damages uh, class. Uh, they are the only ones that will have this uh, bifurcated trial, isn't that true? By necessity, they will have a bifurcated trial. However, it is unclear what sort of process uh, Judge Rolfe in the district court has contemplated. Well, whatever. Uh, that is certainly premature. That, what he's going to do about that for the big class is certainly not before us, is it? Well, it, it would be helpful, since we may not be up before this court again, before the trial, it would be helpful to have prophylactic rules to prevent. Well, address, address the problem of the, of the uh, small number, probably, of uh, opt-outs who, who will have a bifurcated uh, trial. Is that, does that present a real problem? Yes, Your Honor. First of Why? all, we're not sure exactly how many opt-outs there will be. So the, pro the problem is not one we can judge at this point as a question of uh, qualitative terms. In, qu in quantitative terms, in qualitative terms, uh, the bifurcated proceeding should not go forward if there is one opt-out plaintiff whose Seventh Amendment rights are violated. Well, there is a certain irony on both <laughs> sides. The defendants are trying to preserve the plaintiff's <laughs> rights, and the plaintiffs are trying to make sure that the defense contractors stay solvent. Uh. It, it is sort of, <laughs> it is, but um, as this court recognized in, in the Schutz case, a uh, defendant has an interest in ensuring that mm -hmm. all members of the plaintiff class are bound uh, by the judgment. If their rights are violated by the proceedings, they may not be bound by the judgment. Only because the defendant might then have to undergo an additional trial. Isn't that right? Wasn't that the rationale in the Schutz case? That was the basis on which they could assert a right that really wasn't theirs ordinarily and also the fact that it would not be equal because the defendant might not be able to challenge or would be bound by the judgment, but the plaintiff wouldn't. But nonetheless, it would be best to have a procedure that did not violate anyone's rights and therefore everyone would be assuredly bound. The first point I wish to address is the interest of the plaintiff class in this illusory due process uh, fund of punitive damages. It was an abuse of the district court's discretion to certify such a class on the basis of a fund without conducting any fact-finding inquiries to determine whether or not there was actually a fund. There was no investigation of the petitioner's assets or insurance coverage. It is furthermore uncertain what creates this fund, whether it's the number of awards or whether it is the duplicative nature of them. But what would a fact-finding inquiry be directed to? It would be directed to the um, issue of whether or not there was a substantial risk or probability of there being any exhaustion of funds such that some plaintiffs would not be able to recover. Is there any question about that? The yes, court took judicial notice of that, didn't it, in a sense? Well, it's unclear what, I'm not sure that judicial notice would be proper in that case. I'm not sure if plaintiffs 
uh, petitioner's assets are a matter of general knowledge. The court looked at the, at the pleadings, or that's all we know, and made a judgment on the basis of that as a matter of law, not at, as a matter of the balance sheet. What do we know? We know there are 1,600 consolidated cases in this case. Do we also know that there are 35,000 other claims in state courts? The, the, as far as I know, the 35,000 figure is, is inaccurate. The lower court that said that there the, were more federal claims, meaning more than 1,600. It, that, that figure appeared in your opponent's brief. Is there record support for it or not? Um, as far as I know, there is not. It may indicate that there are 35,000 plaintiffs, but there are only, as far as I know, at most 3,200 actual suits. Moreover, the interest of the plaintiff class itself is at a low level. First, because it is not uniform, because the interest arises out of state laws which vary and may allow different amounts of recovery. And second, because it is not an, a, an interest that rises to the level of right. We're not talking here about plaintiffs being frozen out in the cold, not being able to receive compensation for their injuries. There's been no assertion of the necessity of a mandatory class action for compensatory damages, merely for punitive damages. And the sharing arrangements for punitive damages are fundamentally immaterial to the purpose of punitive damages, which is to deter conduct and not to compensate uh, plaintiffs. Will you say then that the one's right to punitive damages in a case where they may be awarded is inferior to one's right to compensatory damages? Yes, I would, Your Honor. One, level, right, one is a matter of right. The other is not a matter of right, as this court has held. Certainly there's an interest in it as a practical matter, isn't there? There certainly is, Your Honor. But it is insufficient to overcome the interests um, of the Anti-Injunction Act and the constitutional rights of the litigants. Well, what would this court hold about the relation of punitive to compensatory damages that would be binding on litigation going on in Ames? I'm so uh, well, I mean, the, 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 certainly there's no general uh, law that supersedes state law of, of the right to compensatory damages as opposed to the right to punitive damages, is there? No, Your Honor. But since those, if any states do grant a right to punitive damages, that right could be preserved um, by applying state law. That, that right would adhere in the plaintiffs in that state and it wouldn't be a uniform interest um, across a nationwide class. Well, and that, 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 to your mind, is what makes it a, an inferior interest to the claim for compensatory damages, its lack of uniformity? No. Well, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is the fact that it is not a matter of right in most of the, in the states whose um, laws are cited by either side. It is a matter of a more practical interest and not a matter of right. I, I don't think I understand what you are, what, what you want. There, there is a class, an opt-out class, for compensatory damages, which you have not appealed. Is that correct? No, we have not, Your Honor. So that uh, uh, the law of the case will be that there will be this class for, for mm -hmm. compensatory damages. Yes, Your Honor. Now, you also say in one argument that you don't want a separate trial for uh, compensatory and, and punitive, so I assume what you want us to do is to modify the punitive class to an opt-out class. Is that what you really want? Yes, Your Honor. That would preserve the constitutional rights of the litigants. Um, and it would be, so long as the, those plaintiffs were allowed to opt out and pursue state court. Well, what about actions? the Anti-Injunction Act? That would still, your argument about that is inconsistent with, with uh, what you've just told me that you want. Not at all, Your Honor, because it is not necessary with a 23B3 opt-out class to enjoin state proceedings, because those parties who wish to go into state court can simply opt out and pursue that course of action. You want the right to proceed in something like a 1,000 cases. It's good for the lawyers. How about the clients? Well, Your Honor, I, it is in the best interest of the clients, to be able, of the plaintiffs, to be able to pursue that course of action they think will best uh, suit their interests. Um, if states wish to consolidate at their own levels into 50 state class actions, um, they remain capable of doing that. There is nothing that says that everything has to be an individual suit. Class actions may go forward. My second point is that certification of a mandatory class action violates the Anti-Injunction Act. In Section 2283 of Title 28, Congress broadly prohibited all injunctions of pending state court proceedings 
in order to protect the institutional integrity of state court systems. It is an absolute prohibition, as this court has held, not a principle of comedy. Moreover, as this court held in Richmond Brothers, it is a prohibition not to be whittled away by judicial improvisation. This court held in Atlantic Coastline that all doubts as to the impropriety of any injunctions are to be resolved against the issuance of injunctions. In other words, this court has always favored non-interference with state court proceedings. Doesn't this fit within the literal language of the innate of court's jurisdiction exception? No, Your Honor, for this injunction is not necessary in aid of its jurisdiction uh, requirement um, this court set forth in the Atlantic Coastline case. How can you have a mandatory class without the injunction? The question is whether the mandatory class is indeed part of the court's uh, jurisdiction. Um, this court's ability to... So you're saying that uh, Rule 23B1B is unconstitutional? Not at all, Your Honor. Or violates, necessarily violates the Anti-Injunction Act? In this case, where there is an injunction against state court proceedings, um, it violates the Anti-Injunction Act. Since the Act only prohibits injunctions <coughs> of pending state court actions, not the institution of new state court actions, for example, if there were an injunction against state court actions before any were started, um, there would be no problem with the Anti-Injunction Act. Uh, Is there any suggestion in, in the legislative history or any decided case that uh, uh, B1B was designed only for classes when there had not already been filed a state court action? No, Your Honor, but th this is one application, the limited fund theory of, uh, of Rule 23B1B. Uh, as Professor Newberg notes in his treatise on class actions, um, 23B1 sorts of um, class certifications were traditionally understood as being useful for injunctive actions or declaratory judgments, where you could, you could would grant for a class an injunction or a declaratory judgment. And there wasn't the aspect of individual treatment that you have here. There could be other cases of certifications, uh, but the Rule 23 should yield to Congress's express. But the uh, committee notes uh, are pretty clear that they contemplate this limited fund situation, are they not? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, that would be proper if this were a sort of fund that approximated that that would be used to support interpleader jurisdiction. There is an, um, an exception noted by this court for interpleader jurisdiction. But this is not the kind of verifiable, quantifiable, tangible fund. That what that. authority do you cite for the proposition that it has to be that kind of fund rather than a practical, in fact, limited fund? Well, this court has never considered the issue directly. But it has held very firmly, over and over again, that in, pa in personam parallel state and federal court proceedings do not interfere with the jurisdiction of either court. And that's not the issue here, though. Yeah, we've got a, an in personam limited fund. That's true. But there is only a rec there is a recognized exception for interpleader cases, but for none others. In several of the courts of appeals that have considered similar cases. Uh, both the A Circuit and the Federal Skywalk case, which considered um, a limited fund of punitive damages arising out of a uh, mass accident. The court held that that was too uncertain a fund to support an injunction. Moreover, there are a number of other circuits that have considered fund-like fund um, amounts and have held that these were insubstantial and not enough like an interpleader fund to uh, support an injunction. This court has remained firm in its uh, distinction between in rem and in personam actions. What principled rationale can you offer, or do you think the court has offered, to distinguish between in rem and in personam actions for purposes of the innate of exception? To a large extent, Your Honor, it comes from Congress's explicit, um, not explicit, but it, its um, manifested intent in the legislative history. The reviser's note indicates that uh, the revised note to the section 2283, which is the only legislative history, notes that the purpose of the revision was to reinstate the law as it was before 2CB New York Life Insurance Company. Before that, the Klein rule held, which held an, an explicit, possibly formalistic, but nonetheless valid distinction between in personam and in rem cases. This court has reaffirmed that distinction in light of uh, uh, a number of times uh, up until 10 years ago. 
which was the last ma time it considered in the which case? Aid. In, in um, Vendo Company versus Lexington. Wasn't that a plurality of opinion of three justices? Yes, Your Honor. But since um, the plurality opinion reversed the district court's two bases for the injunction, uh, and it was the only opinion to uh, address necessary and aid, uh, many commentators have noted that it necessarily had the uh, tacit approval of the, the opinion of two justices concurring in the result who could not have reached that concurrence in the result unless they agreed with uh, the plurality's treatment of the necessary and aid issue. The test in that mm -hmm. uh, Vendo case, as I read it, was whether or not Congress had authorized an injunction, was whether or not the recognized right or remedy could be given its intended scope without the state court injunction. And, and uh, I still don't understand how you're going to have a mandatory class without a state court injunction, so that to give full scope to that, you, it has to be. That test goes not to the necessary in aid of jurisdiction exception. That was applied to the expressly authorized by act of Congress exception. In that case, in um, Vendo Company, there was a congressional enactment, which was the Clayton Act. Here, there is no congressional enactment. There is merely Rule 23 upon which respondent relies. That is not an act of Congress. Your time has expired, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear now from the respondents. Now, Mr. Berman. May it please the court. My name is Ralph Berman. Lauren Reisner and I represent the respondents in this action, Glynis Yardley and a class of similarly situated persons. I will be addressing the issue of federal common law. Mr. Reisner will address the certification of the punitive damages class. This case arises from the exposure of millions of Americans to a dangerous substance placed in cars between 1973 and 1980. Litigation began in 1979 with a number of actions in the District of Ames and the District of North Carolina. By 1981, 1,600 cases had already been filed in federal court. By 1985, 35,000 actions regarding TRIF exposure have, have arisen in both federal and state courts. Your opponent United says States. that's not in the record. <clears throat> well, Your me. Honor, it's in the record at the joint appendix on page 21, footnote number 2, in the court's finding that the TRIF exposure cases far exceed the dimensions of any other single issue ever faced by the federal court system. Where do you get 35,000? The number is specified in the, uh, in the footnote. Glynis Yardley's suit was named the lead action in this case in that it is typical of the injuries alleged and the amounts of damages asked for. She alleges negligence, strict products liability, and a failure of a duty to warn. She's asked for $2 million in compensatory damages and $5 million in punitive damages. For federal common law to supplant state law in a case, two factors must be present. First of all, a federal interest must be present. The issues decided in the case must involve in some way the rights or duties of the United States government. Secondly, the rights and duties of the United States government must be served only by the application of a uniform law for federal common law to supplant state law. It is our position that in this case, the unique facts of the case, both its unique size and the unique amounts of damages asked for in this case, in aggregate, do present federal, do implicate federal interest to such an extent that only uniform federal common law can be applied to this case. We have in our brief identified three federal interests which can only be served by uniformity. The first interest is the interest of the federal government in its relations with its military suppliers. The second interest is the interest of the federal government in the exercise of the judicial power of the United States. And the third federal interest is the interest of the federal government in, presenting, in preventing interstate rivalry between the states over limited resources. Will you give us an illustration or several illustrations of the type of issues that you think should be subject, will come up and will be subject to federal common law? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we would argue that in this case, all of the issues that will come up would be subject to federal common law. Well, that's law. not an illustration. Well, the, the illustration would be, for instance, 
the, plaintiff, the plaintiffs in this case have alleged three, three theories of relief. Negligence, strict products liability, and failure of a duty to warn. The difference between a decision to hold that plaintiffs deserve compensation under strict liability or negligence could mean the difference in billions of dollars of liability on the part of the defendants. Now, how, this, how will application of uniform federal common law further which the interests in military suppliers? Are you making an implicit assumption that federal common law will be more favorable to the defendant military suppliers than with the various state laws? No, Your Honor. We have, we have no interest, especially as the plaintiffs, in protecting the assets of military suppliers. It is our position, however, that the decision as to how much important military suppliers would owe when their very existence or their operations as regards the United States government would be impaired is a decision that must be made as a matter of federal law. Well, you, you cite, I believe, in support of that proposition, the United States against Standard Oil Company, do you not? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, it seems to me you really have to reach uh, to get from there, which was the relationship of the United States to a, a soldier in the Army, to the relationship between the United States and military contractors. Your Honor, the only reason we cited Standard Oil is because it has been used to illustrate the interest in cases that do hold that there is a federal interest between the federal government and its military suppliers. For instance, Stencil Aero Engineering Corporation case, the Katsubas case, and the Bynum case all cited in our, in our brief. In those cases, it was found that the federal interest in its military suppliers required an application of federal common law. And just how does that federal, uh, how would application of federal common law aid the military suppliers if, if that's the purpose of doing it? It's not our position that the military suppliers should be aided, Your Honor. It is our position that the military suppliers' relations with the United States government can only be affected by the operation of federal law. Well, and, and how, how much of the case <coughs> takes up the relation of the military suppliers to the government? Certainly, uh, your, your claims are basically against the suppliers themselves, aren't they not? That's correct, Your Honor. We, we claim that because of the unique size of this case, even our recovery for products liability in the consumer field would necessarily affect the operations of these important military suppliers vis-a-vis -vis the United well, States how, government. Well, how would it affect them? Yeah, did they go bankrupt? Uh, that, that doesn't mean they wouldn't continue to be able to supply. Well, Your Honor, it's not only necessary that they go bankrupt. It could affect, it could affect what they charge for the supplies they, they, uh, they give. It could affect their research and development for future military interests. In, in fact, uh, the, the application of 50 varying state laws to the military suppliers would create an area of uncertainty as regards liability, which would probably raise the insurance costs to all military suppliers and in that way would affect the United States government's ability to, to deal with those suppliers. We are not arguing that these, that these effects should not occur. We are arguing that these effects may only occur as a matter of federal law. State law is not competent to balance these interests properly. State law is not sovereign as regards the duties and obligations of the United States government. Only as a matter of federal law can it be decided that negligence rather than strict liability will apply to this case How because the, the difference between the two implicates federal interest. How I'm sorry, the I'm duties and obligations of the federal government get into this? Because the federal government has a duty, first of all, to provide for the defense of the United States. Necessarily, that is implicated when its relations vis-a-vis -vis those who supply it with the materials necessary to carry out this function are implicated. Likewise, the federal interest in the judiciary is implicated in this case, not because of any, of any interest we have as regards the defendants, it is because of the interest of the United States in exercising its power. In a normal case, there would be no implication of the United States government. A, a small case, 10, maybe 100 plaintiffs, would never, would never result in the kinds of changes of behavior among the military suppliers, which would implicate the interests of the United States. But with 1,600 plaintiffs in, consolidated in this class alone and 35,000 throughout the country claiming millions of dollars of damages, necessarily, even though the complaint does not is not associated with their military activities, necessarily the military activities will be implicated. Likewise, in the, in the case of the judicial powers of the United States, we are not arguing that diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction or any other jurisdictional grant of Congress necessarily implies the application of federal common law. It is only because of the unique size of this case 
and the burden that would be placed on the federal government in exercising the judicial power of the United States, that federal common law must be applied. Didn't the Court of Appeals err in assuming that this crushing weight would be compounded by application of 50 sets of substantive rules without having a factual record or findings on this issue? Well, Your Honor, it's very unclear in the opinion what the court based its finding on. However, well, we, we do... Well, it was a motion. I mean, we do know that there is no, there were no factual findings, don't we? That's correct. Um, we feel that in this case especially, because we will agree with petitioner's assertion that this is an unprecedented circumstance, that it would be very difficult for the court to know exactly what facts this court would require be found. The district, the district well, court... Before you dispense <laughs> with any finding? No, Your Honor, we feel that if this court is not satisfied that, that as a matter of fact, such a judicial gridlock will occur, then this court should still settle the matter of whether such a finding is sufficient to invoke federal question jurisdiction, and then it could remand to the Court of Appeals or the district court for those Why should we give an advisory findings. opinion on that without the relevant findings in the record? Well, Your Honor, this is more than an, an advisory opinion because the Court of Appeals, we feel, with its experience in the asbestos cases where the experience of the United States courts have been less than, less than perfect as far as resolving cases they go. They always are, aren't they? <laughs> it depends on your point of view, but, but in, this, in, in, the case of, in the asbestos cases, um, unsatisfactory would probably be a better way to describe it. And given that the, that the dimensions of this case far exceed anything experienced by the federal courts in the asbestos case, I think that the Court of Appeals was finding that, as a, that, that if, if the asbestos case was, went as badly as it will, then it, just as a matter of logic, this case will basically shut down the federal court system, will impose a burden on diversity jurisdiction. And these sorts of burdens are not the kind of things that state law may impose upon the federal system. The federal government operates as a sovereign over the states, and the state is only sovereign as regards the citizens of this state. Increased costs in the consumer field are not the interest of the federal government. Increased costs in the military field are. The burden on the judicial power of the United States is a federal concern and cannot be balanced by state law. Likewise, the federal government has an interest in solving interstate rivalries between states over limited resources. In this case, we have claimed that there is a limited fund of punitive damages as regards the assets of the defendants, there is probably a limited fund as regards compensatory damages in fact. Uh, are, again, are there, are there findings of any sort on that? No, Your Honor, there are no specific factual findings, but... Well, does that suggest there are kind of general factual findings when you say there are no specific factual findings? Well, the court, the court did allude to the fact that because of the large nature of this case, there, there would necessarily be involved huge, some unprecedented sums of money. And did, is it clear, at all clear from the court's opinion what, it was, what sort of record it was basing that statement on? No, Your Honor, it's not. And in fact, some, uh, it mentioned, uh, states would have a tendency to favor its uh, plaintiffs, uh, assuming there was going to be a limited uh, fund, and award uh, large and, and uh, compensatory and punitive damages early. But isn't that very speculative, especially in light of the fact that most of these cases are in federal court now well, Honor, under the no diversity jurisdiction so that you've already got that, that federal influence that will avoid much of what uh, was speculated about below? Well, Your Honor, first of all, it's not clear that most of the cases are in federal court. I believe in our brief we referred to the fact that probably more than half of the cases are in federal court. There, there is no, we don't know the exact number. It's not clear on the record. However, in this case, we are not simply talking about, uh, for, I'm sorry, if, if the states do change their law to favor plaintiffs and federal common law is not applied, then even in the federal courts under diversity jurisdiction, those same favoring actions will have to take, will have to occur in the federal court. Why couldn't you have a uh, diversity action in federal court, uh, class action uh, for compensatory damages and the mandatory class for punitive damages and have uh, subclasses for each state 
to apply the appropriate state law and uh, you would have all that you're talking about and you don't need federal common law at all. Well, Your Honor, um, I don't know exactly whether that, I don't believe that would give us what we're asking for. In, in those subclasses- Would it give you what you're entitled to? No, Your Honor, it would not. We are, we are in this case entitled to uniform federal common law. The, the point of the question is, you uh, assume arguendo that the only way you can get federal common law is through the necessity argument of the Kansas-Colorado line of cases. Assume arguendo that your uh, military supplier argument is speculative, your judiciary bogging down is speculative, and that's the only way you can get it is necessity. Why doesn't the question I asked indicate that there is no necessity? Well, Your Honor, it very well may be that if our only federal interest were the interstate rivalry interest, that that solution would be an appropriate solution. However, if nothing else is clear from the jurisprudence on federal common law, the one thing that is very clear is that in each case, how the facts of that case burden federal interest is primarily important. We have identified more than just the interstate rivalry. In fact, if anything, the interstate rivalry would serve better to, to diminish the state's interest in the application of its own law and still the military contractor federal interest and the federal judicial interest would mitigate in favor of applying federal common law. One thing, one thing that the, that the uh, petitioners have pointed out is that the states have a very great interest in applying their own state law. We can see that as far as tort law goes, in a normal case, the states do have a great interest. However, this state interest may not, as a matter of our federal system, impose a burden on the federal, on federal interests. Federal law is the only source by which federal concerns can be balanced and weighed. In our case, the interest of the, of the United States in exercising its judicial power and the interest of the United States in its dealings with military suppliers would both be decided as a matter of state law unless uniform federal common law is applied. Are you retreating from the position in your brief which made a nexus between the federal interest and the Consumer Product Safety Act? Well, Your Honor, we never in our brief intended there to be specifically a nexus. We will concede that consumer product law was, that the consumer product law passed by Congress did indeed contain a great deal of respect for state law and no intention to supplant state law. However, our consumer products argument merely goes to the failure of a duty to warn under the Consumer Product Safety Act. Where is that pled in your complaint? Well, Your Honor, it's, it's not pled as a failure to warn under the Consumer Product Safety Act, but it is pled in our complaint that the, that the petitioners knew of a dangerous, knew of, of a danger, that there was a danger as of 1969 in TRIF and did not warn anybody. Necessarily, this implies that they, had a fa that they failed to warn the consumer under state causes of action and also failed to warn the Consumer Product Safety Commission under, under federal law. And that presents a federal question regardless of the issue of federal common law. Well, is that the basis on which your federal jurisdictional uh, argument is? Didn't you um, fail to comply with the federal rules in set setting that forth as the basis for your 1331? Jurisdiction? I believe, Your Honor, we alleged all the facts necessary to state a cause of action upon which relief can be granted. But you're also supposed to state the facts that give you federal subject matter jurisdiction. Well, we did state the facts, Your Honor, if we, if we did not specifically point to them as creating the federal subject matter jurisdiction. I would argue that that was perhaps an error in drafting, but was cert is certainly not cause for finding that there was no allegation of federal jurisdiction. Of course. Well, I've got two questions. One is, I don't understand why you didn't put in your complaint and why you haven't argued in your brief and here that there's a private cause of action under the Consumer Product Safety Act. It looks to me like you've got a real good argument there. The statute says any person who is injured by reason of a violation may sue in district court. 
Why did uh, My time is up. Can I have uh, time Before to simply answer, answer that question? question? Well, Your Honor, you do have a cause of action for a violation of the Consumer Product Safety Act. The only actions by the plaintiff, uh, I'm sorry, by the defendants, which we can point to, which were actual direct viol that we claim were actual direct violations of the Consumer Product Safety Act, were the failure to duty to warn. The negligence, the strict products liability, all the other causes of action do originate in state law. We do concede that. We, we also argue that federal common law must supply the rule of decision because federal interests are implicated, but the origin of those causes of action are indeed under state law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berman. We'll hear now from you, Mr. Reisner. May it please the Court, my name is Lauren Reisner. I'm co-counsel for the respondents in this case. The issue now before this Court is whether it was permissible for the Ames District Court to certify a punitive damages class action under Rule 23B1D of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure to avert the risk that individual actions by trip victims would exhaust a limited fund, thereby foreclosing the recovery of punitive damages by later suing victims. It is the position of respondents that certification was an appropriate exercise of the judge's discretion under Rule 23B1D. Under Rule 23B1D, all that is necessary for a judge to certify is that separate actions risk disposing of class members' interests. The advisory committee notes leave no doubt that Rule 23B1D applies when there are numerous claimants against a limited fund. In this case, the district court found a limited punitive damages fund in law. It is an undisputed fact set forth at page 21 of the record that, that, that there are 35,000 outstanding separate actions against TRIP defendants. It is unlikely that due process will allow petitioners to be punished thousands of times for a single wrongful course of action. Therefore, the judge found a substantial risk that courts would cut off punitive damages before certain plaintiffs could sue and dispose of their interests in punitive damages. Let me ask you the same question in reverse that I asked your adversary. Why are you arguing for a mandatory class? Wouldn't your clients be better off with the opportunity to seek their own punitive damages, which is, in fact, what plaintiffs have argued in most of the reported cases? No, Your Honor. It would not suit their interests because it's much more likely to be a later suing plaintiff after the limited punitive, punitive damages fund has been exhausted than it is to be one of the grand prize winners at the beginning. That's why it's in our interest to argue for the 23B1B class action in this case. Quite frankly, it would not disappoint me as a representative of my clients in this case if there were no limited punitive damages fund because that would enable each of the class members to recover punitive damages. But the fact is... Maybe you have a conflict of interest. <laughs> no, Your Honor. If you let me finish my thought, I think it will become clear. The fact is there is a risk of a limited punitive damages fund, and that risk threatens the interests of all the class members that I represent. And that's the reason we're moving, we moved for a certification of a 23B1B punitive damages fund to protect the interests of the class members in this case from being foreclosed. How do we know there's a limited fund? Your Honor. Maybe they have a pocket so deep that nobody can imagine it. Their, their pocket is irrelevant to the limited fund found by this, by this court in law. The only facts relied upon by the district court in certifying the 23B1B class action was the undisputed fact that there were 35,000 class, 35,000 separate actions outstanding against TRIF defendants. It was unlikely that petitioners could be punished thousands and thousands of times for the same course of action. Their assets, their insurance, they're irrelevant. They have nothing to do with the limited punitive damages fund found in law by the district court in this case. There is no necessary factual finding in this case because all the necessary facts to a limited fund in law were found and are not in dispute. Furthermore, there is no doubt that class members in this case have an interest cognizable by Rule 23B1B. Rule 23B1B protects practical interests. It is not Respondent's position tonight that this court must find that plaintiffs have a right in punitive damages, but only that plaintiffs have a, a practical interest that is protectable under Rule 23B1B. And the fact is that as the law exists, punitive damages are awarded and given to the injured victims of a tortfeasor. 
Therefore, each injured victim of this tortfeasor, the plaintiff that we represent, has an interest as an eligible recipient of the fund in the fund of punitive damages in this case. You said a moment ago, in answer to Justice Slover's question, Mr. Reisner, that the finances and insurance coverage of the defendants was irrelevant to the punitive damages issue. And that, I take it, is because you see there being some limiting principle on the award of uh, punitive damages. Now, has this court ever said anything like that? This court has not, but it has never faced the issue. But in the Agent Orange case, the asbestos school litigation, a limited fund in law, a risk of a limited fund in law was found. And it's clear from cases such as Acosta versus Honda Motor Corporation that courts of appeal appeals have been vigilant in their regulation of the punitive damages awarded against a petitioner but it's, for a single course of action. Your brief really takes that for granted, it seems to me. And if you're asking for a ruling from this court, that uh, one of the supports to which would be that proposition, it seems to me that you should have devoted more attention to it on the merits. No, Your Honor, I beg to differ. The fact is that all that's necessary under Rule 23 is a risk of a limited fund. In this case, the district court found a substantial risk of a limited fund based on his analysis of the law and the fact that there were 35,000 separate actions outstanding against TRIF defendants. Yes, but a question of law is reviewable de novo in the Court of Appeals. It's reviewable de novo here. And if the question of law on which the district court based his judgment was that punitive damages is limited the way you think, it seems to me that obviously is a question open to us. And if we don't decide it in your favor, it does a great deal to your theory. It, it absolutely is open to you, Your Honor. And in fact, if you find that there is no due process limit upon the award of punitive damages, there still is a limited fund in this, in this case. But you need not reach that decision. All you need find is there is a risk. Rule 23B1B is a judicial device to respond to risks. This court need not find tonight that there is definitely a due process limit upon punitive damages for the 23B1B class to go the forward. The risk is that we wouldn't find that punitive damages have no limit as far as it, what no, is the, the, define the risk. The risk is that there's a limited fund of punitive damages mandated by in due process. In actuality or in law? In law, mandated by due process. If this court tonight finds that there is no limited punitive damages fund in law, I concede that there can be no limited, there can be no certification under Rule 23B1B on that theory. However, the obvious impact upon petitioner's assets by 35,000 separate claims, of which Glynis Yardley's has been conceded is typical and asked for $7 million, yields $200 billion in liability for petitioner. $200 billion is more than the biggest corporation in the United States. And we would say that if you deny, if you deny the fact that there might be a, a due process limit upon punitive damages, the certification under 23B1B is still proper based on the limited fund of punitive damages in law that petitioner's assets in this case might be depleted. Therefore, the class action can be certified to protect the interests of later suing plaintiffs in recovering punitive damages. Nor does the certification violate the Anti-Injunction Act because the stay of state court proceedings is essential to the purposes of Rule 23B1B and vital to the preservation of the subject matter of this litigation. The injunctive effect of Rule 23B1B certification is necessary in aid of the district court's jurisdiction because exhaustion of that limited fund by the state courts would destroy the federal court's ability and authority to adjudicate this class action. They would be left with an empty jurisdiction, with claimants before them requesting punitive damages, yet nothing in the punitive damages fund to award those plaintiffs within their jurisdiction. This is exactly the type of situation that the necessary and aid exception to the Anti-Injunction Act seeks but to- But this is, in fact, an in personam proceeding, and how do you distinguish the opinion in Vendo, which states that use of the necessary and aid of exception is inapplicable in in personam proceedings. Was that opinion wrong? Your Honor, first of all, Vendo was a plurality opinion and not the opinion of the court. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, the reason the court makes that distinction between a, an in personam action and an in rem action is because in most in personam cases, the only interference with the federal court is the race judicata effect of the state court judgment. In this case, the impact and the interference upon the federal court is not race judicata, but an actual exhaustion of a limited fund of punitive damages. Well, Mr. Look, Reisner, supposing that plaintiff A sues the X company in the state court in Ames and asks for a $200,000 tort judgment, 
Then plaintiff B goes into the federal district court in Ames and asks for a $200,000 tort judgment against uh, X company and says X company has assets of only $200,000. It has no insurance coverage. Therefore, if the plaintiff in the, first, in the state court wins, its assets will be exhausted. So I ask you to enjoin the prosecution of Action A. There is absolutely no way that the Anti-Injunction Act permits the federal court to enjoin that situation. Well, that you how, how is presented. that all that different from your Because case? in the situation that you've just presented, we have an instance of in personam concurrent jurisdiction where the federal court has no special competence. But you've also got the limited fund in his situation. Correct, Your Honor, but the limited fund, I, I'm trying to now distinguish the in personam in rem distinction that the court has made. And the reason, in answer to Justice Rehnquist's question, is that in this case, unlike the case that you've just presented, the federal courts have a special competence to adjudicate the question of the limited fund of punitive damages because of the very existence of Rule 23B1B. They could bring all plaintiffs in front of the federal court and adjudicate the claims so that no plaintiff is foreclosed. It's that special competence well, in this so, case. So supposing in the, in the case I posit you that the plaintiff who sues in the district court name says, I want a class action, and I want to represent the plaintiff who's already suing in the state court. In, uh, can you just present that once more, Your Honor? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get well, it. Well, su supposing the hypothetical mm -hmm. I previously suggested, first case filed in state court, $200,000 prayer, $200,000 limit on asset. Second case filed in the federal district court, plaintiff says, I want to make this a class action. And it's a legitimate class action between the plaintiff's federal court a case and the other plaintiffs in the state court. Well, Your Honor, in the case that you just presented, it's hard for me to say whether a class action be, should be certified because we don't know how many plaintiffs are present. First of all, if the, if the, if the prerequisites are... I suppose they're just enough to meet the numerosity requirement. <laughs> <laughs> if, but there's a question after that. There's a question after the numerosity requirement and, and after the rest of the 23A prerequisites. And that question is, does due process limit the fund of punitive damages in the particular case that you have presented? If so, and if a class action is moved for in the federal court, that special competence of the federal court should allow a class action. Um, just to finish up, the distinction between in rem and in personam that this court has, has used in the past, this is not a parallel in personam case like Oklahoma packing and the other court cases that, that this court has decided regarding the Anti-Injunction Act. The fact is, when race judicata is pleaded in the federal court against federal class action members in this case, they will not have had a fair and full adjudication in the state courts, unlike every case this is decided while refusing to issue an injunction under the necessary and aid of jurisdiction exception. In this case, the members of the federal class action were strangers to the state court proceedings, and this court has not yet faced a case where it has refused to issue an injunction and found the Anti-Injunction Act as a bar to the issuance of an injunction when it was necessary to protect the interest of strangers to state court proceedings that brought suit in the federal courts. In both the Munoz case and the Bimco case, this court held that the Anti-Injunction Act was not a bar to suits, when, was not a bar to injunctions when it was necessary to protect the interest of strangers to the state court proceedings. The injunctive effect of Rule 23B1B has also been expressly authorized by Congress. Rule 23B1B can only be given its intended scope by enjoining the procedures in the state courts. This is not a generalized injunction like the Vendo case, where an interaction with, with state proceedings was not focused upon or necessary. It is absolutely necessary to Rule 23B1B that state actions be enjoined so that the mandatory class can take effect. Without the, injun the injunction of the state courts, there can be no mandatory class action because the state proceedings can wipe out the limited fund of punitive damages. Therefore, Rule 23B1B can only be given its intended scope if state proceedings are enjoined. If it is determined that federal common law is inappropriate in this case, could you still maintain a mandatory class for punitive damages? Yes, Your Honor, you could. How? One way you could do it is to maintain the 23B1B certification across all the members of the federal class action and then create subclasses, 50 different subclasses for each state where state law can be applied in those different states. The punitive damages awarded could be accumulated across the federal class action. I'm glad you were listening to Justice Anderson. Go ahead. <laughs> The, the punitive damages fund could then be accumulated across the plaintiffs 
uh, could be accumulated across the proceedings and allocated toward the allocated between the plaintiffs in the federal class action. So it is not necessary for federal common law to apply so that for the 23B1B class action to survive. Moreover, Your Honor, Doesn't that mean that federal common law is not necessary? No, Your <laughs> Honor, because federal common law is necessary for all the federal interests that my co-counsel has set forth previously. <laughs> Moreover, Your Honor, Petitioners argue that Rule 23B1B is not an act of Congress. We concede that it is not a, the, the outcome of traditional legislating by Congress. However, the rules of civil procedure are set to, sent to Congress for a 90-day review. And yeah, this but what judicial ledger domain can we use to transform a federal rule into a congressional act? This court held in Sivak v. Wilson that Congress reserved to itself the power to ensure that federal rules of civil procedure comport with the con congressional purpose by mandating the 90-day review period. This court set forth in SIBAC that that 90-day review period is not to be taken lightly. Congress understands what they are doing in those 90 days. And after the 90 days, if, those, if the federal rules of civil procedure were not, or a new one is not, disapproved, it has the force and effect of an act of Congress. It's not so much the form of the act of Congress that's needed to, set, to satisfy the, nece the, nece the expressly authorized exception to the anti-injunction. It's the substance. As this court set forth in the Amalgamated Clothing Workers case, there is no prescribed formula to satisfy the requirements of this exception to the Anti-Injunction Act. What's important is to look at the congressional intent. And in this case, it's clear that through the, through the approval of that, in that 90-day consideration period, Congress intended Rule 23b1b to enjoin state court proceedings. Of course, Rule 23b1b doesn't expressly authorize the issuance of an injunction. No, Your Honor, but, it, but it's necessary to achieve its intended scope, and that's all that the Mitchum test demands to meet the expressly authorized test. It's not necessary for the court to expressly say, this is an exception to the Anti-Injunction Act. This, this court has held that numerous times, including the Amalgamated Clothing Workers case. Nor is due process violated by the certification in this case. The Schutz Court expressly held that class action plaintiffs need not have minimum contacts with the forum in which the class action is held. Petitioner's discussion about hailing plaintiffs into, into, an, into a forum. But they have to have an opportunity to opt out, and the members of the mandatory punitive class here don't have that opportunity. No, Your Honor, I'm, uh, that's, that's incorrect because the Schutz Court only regarded a Kansas analog to Rule 23b3. Of course, in both the federal rules of civil procedure and in the class action in Schutz, plaintiffs had to be given an opportunity to opt out because that's part of Rule 23b3 as set forth in the opt-out provision in Rule 23c2. However, Rule 23b1b has no opt-out provisions. Rule 23c2, which sets forth the opt-out provision for Rule 23b3, expressly it just doesn't include Rule 23b1b. And it makes sense because the mandatory class action under Rule 23b1b involves interests where the plaintiffs have I the identically same interest in the limited fund, for example, in this case. Their interests are so tightly bound that so long as adequate representation is present, due process has been met, and there is no necessity of plaintiffs having minimum contact with the form in which the class action is held. If there are no further questions, Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Reisner. Petitioners have reserved time for rebuttal. Your Honors, if it pleases the Court, I'd like to turn briefly to the military interest asserted and then turn to the certification issues. Even if there is a uniquely federal interest in securing military materiel for the federal government, that does not mean that the courts are then authorized to create the federal common law. As this Court held in Standard Oil, in matters affecting fiscal policy, the Court would, that was a matter left for Congress. Where Congress acted to fill the void, even if states were preempted, then Congress could fill the void. 
uh, in terms of the indemnification relationship there, but that the courts would not intrude into that area to create federal common law. Well, the holding in Standard Oil was that they, it was governed by federal common law, but the federal common law was against the government, as I read it. <laughs> um, as I understand the case, Your Honor, they held that the state, the court there held that the states were preempted and state law could not apply, but that there would be no law in there because Congress had not acted and that was a realm for Congress. In this case, if there is an interest in shielding, uh, shielding the producers of TRIF, then that aspect of it would be covered governed by federal law that Congress could provide. That does not attack the liability laws themselves. It just means that the states could not provide um, immunity rules themselves. I'd like to turn now to the certification issues. Uh, the first thing I'd like to deal with is, um, is the Schutz issue. This court held in Schutz that due process at a minimum requires that plaintiffs be given a chance to opt out. Now it is not that they lack minimum contacts with a forum because plaintiffs can consent to the jurisdiction, but that absent those contacts, plaintiffs should not be forced to litigate in that forum. This court did not hold as a matter of Rule 23 of the Kansas Code or as an, an analog to Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. It held as a matter of due process, and that due process interest does not change because the court used a different rule to certify under it. It governs all of the cases. Wouldn't that a, go, no, go ahead. After you. <laughs> Wouldn't that apply to all 23B1B classes then? No, Your Honor. I can think of at least two cases where, that would, where um, such actions would be constitutional. First, where all of the plaintiff class members resided in the state in which the district court was located or had minimum contacts. Or secondly, where the court was acting on federal question jurisdiction and therefore would not necessarily be bound by the amenability to suit rules that apply to state courts and to federal courts acting on diversity jurisdiction. So those are at least two very broad areas that would not be affected by an application of shuts in this case. There is strong language that supports you in uh, Schutz saying that minimum due process requires the opt-out. But it was dicta, was it not, because there was clearly opt-out there, so the court did not have to decide whether that was necessary. Well, that is true, Your Honor. The court did say that it was limiting its holding to, to classes, not opt-out classes, but to classes seeking purely monetary or primarily monetary damages, as opposed to defendants' classes and uh, classes seeking injunctive relief. So it, it took into its scope not only 23b3, but into its consideration also um, other sorts of class actions by its mention and exclusion of certain other types of classes that would not be covered by its holding. Certainly, there's no reason to distinguish between the two. The differences are matters of rule certification, not fundamental due process. Well, you, you've proved it's conscious dicta rather than unconscious dicta, but it's still dicta. Yes, it? and uh, <laughs> petitioners pray that this court makes it firm law in this case. Turning to the stranger's exception, which respondent urges, uh, the respondent cites the Minos case and Hale v. Bimco trading. Uh, those cases um, refer to an exception for injunctions against enforcement of unconstitutional state statutes, uh, which certainly is not the case here. There is no unconstitutional state statute. Moreover, the Hale case um, came before the revision, and as um, Justice Powell noted in his concurring opinion in um, Minos, it is possible that the, Hale opinion, that the Hale exception should receive further scrutiny in any case because it is contrary to the policy of the act. The critical point to remember here is that Respondent urges a very easy way of certifying a fund based on limited, uh, certifying a limited fund based on punitive damages. It therefore follows that once you've certified, you get your injunction. This would create the kind of massive hole in the wall that surrounds the state judicial processes that Congress has erected. This kind of exception would, as I believe Chief Justice Rehnquist's hypothetical suggests, apply not only in um, cases where there are lots of numbers. For that's not the issue. The issue is the duplicativeness of the punishment. It would also apply in cases that were not class actions where there were two suits and a risk of exhaustion. And that's why the circuit courts have refused to find an exception based on a possible inability to recover. In this case, there is simply... Your, your time has expired, counsel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. The court will stand at recess to the call of the bailiff.
just, we just, no, it's not. Who is, um, We just had a couple of announcements that we wanted to tell everybody. Um, the judges are in the chambers deliberating now for the winning team and the best oralist, and they will be in there for several minutes. First of all, we wanted to congratulate all of the contestants. They've worked really long and hard on this since last fall. They deserve a big... And there are also a couple of other people who we'd like to specifically thank tonight. Um, first of all, um, there was also a lot of work that went into um, preparing and writing the record. Um, Professor Arthur Miller and also um, an attorney who's in the audience, Michael Fredrickson, who was right over here, I don't know if he's still there, were, uh, worked on producing this record and we wanted to thank him for putting in his time. There are also a lot of other people who helped out in making tonight come off, but we just wanted to come up here and congratulate everybody.
Be seated. Uh, the judges have deliberated and are prepared in due course uh, to announce the <coughs> winners of the best brief, the best oralist, and the best team. But before we did that, uh, each of us has a few observations about the art of oral advocacy or something to that effect. Uh, <laughs> Judge Anderson? I'll start with uh, the last oralist. Uh, Mr. Well, bef before I do that, uh, Justice Rehnquist is going to say all the nice things. Uh, <laughs> We, 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 we did think all of you did well and, and obviously have spent a lot of time and obviously have a lot of talent. To uh, Mr. Reesner, uh he answered questions well, uh, obviously knew his case. I'm, I'm thinking as I go. Uh, and, and I tell my law clerks that in presenting a, a case to an appellate court, the one thing that is more important than anything else is knowing the case. You ought to know the case better than anybody in the, in the courtroom. And uh, uh, once you do, just be yourself. And, and uh, there is no style uh, that is better than another style. <coughs> If you are just yourself and if you know the case, you will you'll uh, do well. Answering questions from the bench, though, is important because in, in most cases, they are, uh, judges don't ask questions unless they are interested in a point. I often will uh, tell the uh, lawyer that it, it seems to me that such and such a case controls it uh, against his client. And, he didn't convince me in his brief, uh, I'll give him a chance at oral argument. And he's got a chance to convince me. And a lot of times I'm dead wrong because I have just uh, spent a few hours reading the briefs and you have spent uh, months, perhaps. Mr. Reesner uh, was perhaps a little bit too intense in that he, <laughs> he, uh, he continued uh, at the same high pitch throughout uh, instead of modulating it some. Mr. Berman uh, had an extremely difficult uh, task because, <laughs> because uh, there was not much he could argue. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I did think, though, that you emphasized in both your brief and in your oral argument uh, uh, points that, that I thought were almost frivolous, the military supplier point and the judiciary bogging down, and did not emphasize as much as you should the only uh, uh, point that, that had some strength, and that was the necessity argument under the Kansas v. Colorado line of cases. And had you been very sensitive, you might have picked up my thinking from the oral argument questions and, and focused more on that at oral argument, which uh, you did not do. You, you stuck with those other two and left very little time for the necessity argument. Mr. Cooper was uh, very good, answered questions very well. If I think of something uh, in particular after my turn is gone, I'll come back. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bellamy was a little nervous to start off with, is, is hard to do. Uh, and uh, if I look at my notes and find some other comments, I'll come back to you also. Thank you, Judge Anderson. Judge Sloviter. Well. I'm sandwiched in between the Dutch uncle talk of Judge Anderson that comes out so well when it's said with Southern charm, and, <laughs> and Justice Rehnquist's remarks, which are what you all are waiting for. <laughs> 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 
So I'll just comment generally and very briefly, um, and not do the, the, not repeat what was said. Uh, for those of you who are just listening and have not been a part of the preparation of this, I think a word should be said to explain to you how much work and how much time has gone into the preparation of the briefs that six students did on each side, if I'm correct on that. Um, the um, four people on each side from whom you did not hear spent as much time in the preparation and the assistance of the oral argument, and I think they merit um, your acknowledgement, and I think it's only fair to ask them, unless you were prepared to do that, to ask them each to stand up and um, take a, a bow for each of you. The other unsung heroes of a competition like this are the people who put it together. And those are the members of the Moot Court Board. And as you know, I don't know what happened when we were out there, but did somebody uh, introduce to you the chairman of the Moot Court, the two people, as well as the rest of the Moot Court Board? Do you have to tell me what happened? No, I see no, so I will assume. Well, then I think you all ought to uh, acknowledge the excellent work done by the Moot Court Board and particularly by the co-chairmen whose names are Jay Ebert and Leslie Hisco, right? <laughs> now, in general, I spent Monday and Tuesday of this week hearing um, two intense days of oral argument in my court because we put them all on Monday and Tuesday so that I could come here for this. And they were important cases, and they were very well argued cases, unlike some of those we sometimes get. And I spent last week in some difficult in-bank cases on our court, and I can really say um, that the arguments that you heard here today were on a level with the arguments that we heard that we think are good. And so that says a lot for young people who um, haven't had the weathering and the experiences, some of, and who are doing it for nothing, um, <laughs> who haven't had the weathering and experience. So I thank you. I thank you for inviting me. I always learn a great deal from a moot court problem uh, because I work as hard on it as I do for a real case. I'm not going to decide this one, but I think. Um, that I learned from the briefs, and I certainly learned from the questions of my colleagues on the bench, so I thank you. And I turn you over to Justice Rehnquist, who will say something you want to hear. Yes, but before I get to what you want to hear, I'll <laughs> give you a very brief uh, re uh, reaction to the oral argument, in which I totally agree with Judge Anderson and Judge Sloviter. Uh, they're fully the equal of many arguments we, we hear in our court. And uh, you're, you all did a good job. Uh, I, I do agree with some of Judge Anderson's observations. I think something negative should be said about everybody on an occasion like this. And <laughs> so that you don't get swelled heads from being told that you're the greatest. <clears throat> and so, now, Mr. Bellamy, uh, your voice was quite monotonous when it started out. You warmed up as you went along, but it wouldn't hurt to try to warm up a little sooner. <laughs> uh, Mr. Cooper, the same of yours a little bit, but I think you warmed up a little sooner than Mr. Bellamy did. Uh, Mr. Berman, you used the word mitigate when you should have used the word militate. And it's a mistake to, uh, to use a, misuse a word if you can possibly avoid it, because then one's initial immediate reaction is, well, you know, what else is wrong with this guy's argument other than he doesn't know the difference between militate and mitigate? So it's best if you uh, don't, aren't fully confident of what a word means to use perhaps a simpler word or else look it up in the dictionary beforehand. <laughs> Mr. Eisner, uh, 
your uh, Judge Anderson said you were a little bit intense, and I agree with him on that. And that's not to say that intensity isn't a good thing at the very peaks of your argument or at the point you most want to make to the court. But if you're intense for 17 and a half minutes, and that's the length of your argument, it eventually wears off. Y you ought to have a kind of a more uh, cyclical presentation where you know you work up to a pitch and then subside, and then work up to a, to another pitch. Uh, most of you in, in the audience, at least the students, I'm sure, are too young to uh, remember Senator Everett Dirksen from mm -hmm. Illinois, who was colloquially known as the Wizard of Ooze because of his <laughs> propensity to talk. But he was an excellent orator. And one thing that he observed that has stayed with me is the absolutely magnetic effect during an oration of an absolute silence. The orator simply stops, pauses, has a drink of water. <laughs> Now, it doesn't hurt to do that. Perhaps you don't want to come to a complete pause, but you want to have variety in your high points and your low points. Well, thus, thus spake uh, the justices. Have you thought of anything else, Judge Anderson, before I announce the awards? We did agree to say one uh, negative thing about each, and, and I, I see on my notes uh, about Mr. Bellamy uh, that I, <laughs> I, I didn't think of earlier that you, you took, for our court, you took too long on the procedures and the facts. Uh, our, in our court, we announced to begin with that the judges have read the briefs and are familiar with the facts, and uh, uh, unless the lawyer wants to emphasize the facts for some particular reason, he need not repeat the facts for us or the procedural posture of the case. Is that true in your court also? Yes, it generally is. I thought perhaps Mr. Bellamy was speaking for the benefit of the audience to a certain extent, but certainly if you're just speaking for the benefit of the court, I think you generally assume that, that the court knows, knows the record. Oh. I, I had one comment. more, yeah, I had one comment. I thought all of you could well learn to look more carefully at congressional statutes, and I guess state statutes if you're ever dealing with them. I think you tended to read a lot more into the statutes than they might say. And you can't say expressly or explicitly when it isn't express or explicit. And I, I think that was both sides ran into that. And I think that's a matter of some concern. I, presumably, Congress knows what it's saying when it says it. I mean, those of us who have the difficulty sometimes of working with it may question that. But in these cases, I didn't think the acts were at all ambiguous. And it may be implied or implicit, but that's very different from saying that something is express or explicit. And I think that's something you really should keep in mind as law students also in your argument. All right, well, the judges have deliberated and we've been asked to find three winners, the best brief, the best oralist, and the best team. And this is the result of our deliberations that the best brief was that of the petitioners. Uh, Judge Anderson has reminded me to mention a rather important fact in that each vote was split among us. <laughs> uh, probably in typical judicial fashion. <laughs> Uh, the best oralist was Mr. Reisner. <laughs> and the best team was the petitioner. Bailiff, if you have no further work for us, perhaps we should adjourn. <laughs>